I met Brian a year, a couple of years, about years, a couple of years, was probably four or five years ago. And I was working for a company based out of Lakeland, Florida. Brian came in and did a sales training for our organization and uh, it was quite entertaining. And, mm -hmm. uh, Where do you work, James? Or did Pardon? you work at the time? Uh, I'm, I'm still working, actually, believe it or not. I work for an electrical engineering design firm. We uh, specialize in utility power. At the time, it was uh, instrumentation. So, uh, but Brian was quite entertaining and at the same point, uh, educational. So I've kind of uh, been following him and annoying him off and on for the past four or five years. <laughs> now tell me, what among the things that you learned from Brian that day, did you make part of your work life? Uh, it's an interesting question. Um, we had, uh, Brian made it rather competitive and I think our group won the sales presentation and I think I won the individual presentation, yes, which really kind of surprised the hell out of me because <laughs> I, I, you know, I kind of, it reinf he reinforced stuff that I was already doing. How's that? Um, probably not as quite as good as he is. Uh, obviously he's moved on to golfing and doing sales training. Uh, so he's, um, but still selling, but uh, yeah, I would say he reinforced a lot of what I was doing. And, and I think um, adds in that one factor, you know, be, be yourself when you're in front of people. Don't, you know, essentially be, be honest. That's all there's to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah. I agree. yeah, that was fun, James. And, well, and, and what I loved about, so, so we went around the country with James's company and did these different sessions. And, and James, you, you would say that the, you know, the average age of the sales team wasn't 23 years old. There was an experienced group and a lot of engineers. And Joe, you, you know this, just living in the, the healthcare world that we live in, you know, there's a lot of complexities. There's, you know, uh, anatomy, physiology, a lot of engineering and so it can the message often becomes really complex and convoluted and what i loved about someone like james james is essentially a smart guy an engineer guy <laughs> he's and essentially he's guy, a smart guy he's <laughs> essentially a smart guy unlike me um and so what i love about someone if you can combine someone who has all this knowledge and skill in their head but don't think that they're think that their job is to just spew a bunch of facts and figures and bore the hell out of people. Then you have a really good salesperson, right? And so, combining that knowledge with knowing when to use it and not to use it is really important. But it's also often really hard for the, I would say, the specialists, like the subject matter experts. I know a lot of the companies you have the sales rep who reels in the prospect, and then you bring in the smart guy. Well, often that smart guy's presentation is boring as hell because they talk too much. And so working with the engineer or those specialist type salespeople, sometimes it's difficult for them to understand that, hey, our job is to actually just listen more than you do tell and teach. And, and, and so um, it, it's so cool to see someone like James who's still interested. He's not 24 years old and he's still trying to get better. And, and I get fired up when I hear a guy who's been doing this for 30 years get fired up to win a cheesy little trophy and dominate everyone else standing up in front of people and presenting and so, so to me i love the vets who are just they want to be better than the you know the young 24 year old guy who i was who thought he knew everything and, and james, so where, where is that trophy today james do you do you still have it <laughs> in the bedroom i should look at my wife when i want to impress her <laughs> oh okay you're that bad <laughs> well hey you gotta sell all the time right fair enough <laughs> <laughs> and you got to overcome a, 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 a objections too and rejection, right, James? That happens too. <laughs> Just a quick hello to the other folks, James or Maya or York, or we got to celebrate Larry's shirt before we start. I mean, that's the whole point of today's show, I think. Beautiful. You're on mute. Morning. Hi. From sunny Wisconsin. This is my okay. Cardinal shirt. Oh, see, I'm not a baseball fan. Is there something going on today? I went to a baseball game. Season? Went to a baseball game last Friday. It was the first one in almost two years. So uh -huh. I was happy. <laughs> now we go to a Brewers my, uh... game tomorrow night, Milwaukee Brewers. I've never been to one of those. So that'll be a first. Uh, congratulations to your Bucks. Thank you. <laughs> Cle Cleveland is going to be the uh, Guardians going forward. They just announced the uh, interesting logo for the new the new branding for them today. So what are baseball? they? They're going to be the Cleveland Guardians going forward. Guardians. OK. Yeah. Wow, interesting. All right, a little bit of baseball trivia there. Okay, well, we'll start our show. Uh, Jorg, I know you're you're in business development, so I I know you're going to pick up a thing or two from from our Always guests. interested. Yeah, so and thank you. Uh, you bet. So I am going to just narrow it down to us two, and of course, we'll bring folks back on as they have questions or comments or follow ups. Um, I'm going to start. Uh, with a 
story about my success because of Brian. And he may not recall, but he might remember this story uh, about his significance in my little life here uh, as, a, as an independent consultant. I don't know what's going on technically. I cannot get rid of James. No offense, James. Change role to attendee. I'm clicking on it as hard as I can. It will not go away. Mm. Back in 2011, uh, my employer, Cardiac Science, was bought out slash under, and uh, I was to be displaced. And my wife said, uh, Joey, you should be a consultant. And I said, I don't think so. I don't think I'd like it. But here we are a decade later, and Beth is never wrong, which is one key takeaway. Um, I had seen Brian at a, I don't even remember what, I, I think it was, um, maybe it was Haida. I, I don't know. And, um, and he impressed me so much as he's wont to do in front of really any audience he has. And um, I, uh, I saw him on Twitter, which was a thing at the time, it still is. And uh, I wrote a comment, I wrote, I aspire to be to medical device marketing, what Brian is to medical device sales. He didn't ask for that, I just, thought it, felt it, shared it. And one of Brian's clients was Gunter Vessels, whom most of you know and has presented a couple times and has been my 10X guest a, a number of times. And uh, he liked it. And I went down that rabbit hole and looked at uh, Gunter and I saw his site, which was woeful. And I reached out to him and I said, if you'd like a little constructive criticism, I kind of do this and that. and. I'll be happy to have a talk. Uh, $40,000 later, um, he worked out to be a pretty good client back when he was at TIGI. And the point of the story is a couple things. Uh, one is, I, I really did not have an ulterior motive. I just wanted to celebrate Brian. And because I gave freely, lovingly of myself, nothing expected in return, the karma was that someone else said, yeah, I love him too. And we had a, a Brian Fest that resulted in me being able to cover my mortgage for a couple of months. Um, and it goes back to how James is on this call as a panelist, because I can't seem to get rid of him. Um, because he, you resonated with him too, and you made a difference. And now he's following you. And you know, if he were in a position to have you come back or whatever, just my opener for uh, Brian. And I know this is very consistent because I watch his weekly videos and I enjoy them when they come in my box is, you know, being yourself and just being comfortable, um, expressing, dare I say, love. And people notice that's genuine. That's not, I'm trying to, I wasn't trying to sell Brian anything. I wasn't trying to get something out of him. I was just saying, you know, and good things happened. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Well, and and um, I do remember the phone call that you and I had not long after that, and we talked about the medical distribution group on LinkedIn and how you you were involved in that, and 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 um, you know, and and how excited you were to start. I mean, that that was a, you talk about moments in your life where good things happen for a reason, and here we are, eleven years later, and think how big the medical distribution group. On LinkedIn is and, and you know, how many of those relationships that you have built. And so I, I love, you know, for before I had, you know, James was talking about, I have a, I have a golf radio program on ESPN a channel here and a podcast that I do with George Brett. For you baseball fans, my uh, my co-host is, is him. But before that, I had a um, business radio show called The Entrepreneurial Moment for 11 years. And we had some great guests, you know, I the CEO of Southwest Airlines and I mean, a really high powered guest. And I was always looking for that nugget like you are, Joe, you're always wondering what you're going to learn on things like this from guys like James, you don't even know, right? You have no idea what, what you're going to learn. And so I was always looking for those little nuggets, you know, how does someone become a CEO of Southwest Airlines? How does, and it wasn't only business, it was the folks who conquered life, who were really happy. And, and the lessons were they weren't complex. They were really simple. And the, the one thing I got out of it was um, never be afraid to ask for help. So these people were really good on their journey to the top, always asking for help. 
And they were also, once they got into a spot where they were maybe of authority, they, they gave help and they expected nothing in return, to your point. And so that karma, I think, that is created from being humble enough to say, I don't know everything, would you please help me? And once you know something, offering yourself up to folks, uh, it, 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 good stuff just happens, you know? And, and I think that's, you know, LinkedIn is a great tool to meet those type of people. And, and I'll still, before we got on the air uh, uh, today, I had a young 22 year old sales rep. Um, I don't know her, reached out to me through LinkedIn and said, hey, I just put together a cold calling script. Would you be kind enough to review it and just give me your thoughts? I don't know this person. Now, I could big timer and say, oh, please. So you have to monetize this. So I have to, right? And you don't do that. You say, this is awesome. You've got someone who's excited about selling and you spend as much time with that person as you would the person cutting you a $10,000 check. That's how we're all supposed to do it, you know? And, and we're not supposed to pat ourselves on the back as a result of doing it. And I think that goes back to what you said is, you know, um, what I say is the greatest salespeople are the ones who, who are the, the, the most selfless. I think it, it, because I think there's energy and vibe that comes off people's bodies that is actually more important than even the words that are coming out of your mouth. And you feel it. Mm -hmm. You know when it's real and you know when it's authentic and, and, and your, your body is comfortable and, and your client's body is comfortable. Even if they don't know you, it just feels right, you know, and that's, and, and so that's something I really learned from these leaders is that be humble, give help, ask for help. And then the other thing is keep studying, take an hour each week to do nothing but learn something new. And, and, you know, your brain's an asset and that thing's either appreciating or depreciating and, um, you got to keep getting smarter. And that's why, I, you know, I love seeing experienced folks joining communities like this saying, I'm not done with learning because how fun would that be? Mm -hmm. Right. Just to be fried and done. And, and that's, that's no fun. So, so really cool experiences, um, you know, through, through that program and, and of course, LinkedIn and these things and podcasts have just become a great way for us to all learn from each other. What I love about, um, this format is, as you saw, we, we start the morning with just saying hi and you don't know, you know, what's going on with folks, but, um, right. I, you know, I, I know my members well enough to know that, you know, I'd say at least a half dozen of them really don't have anything they would think to do with selling. That's not their thing. This guy does regulatory. This if one's an auditor. That one's like, but they show up anyhow. Yeah. Um, I speculate because, you know, it's us friends getting together. Uh, it's nice to say hi, even if they drop off a little later. If they're not careful, they might actually learn something. And um, it's a good way to be better rounded. And I think most importantly, you know, uh, I think the the most important part of selling these days is uh, being top of mind when somebody needs you. So for example, I don't right now need uh, an expert FDA witness. I don't know that I ever will, but somebody might. And I'll be like, oh, you should call Larry. And I wouldn't know that that's one of Larry's specialties unless it kind of came up as we were talking here one week. And then I was like, you have to do a whole thing on that. you know. And so it's the thing about this program, this premium program is it's, it's you know, you can find the answers to just about anything by Googling. And you can say, hey, Joe, do you know anyone who? And I could go either, you know, there was somebody I met I think it was four years ago. I can't remember his name now, but I think he was really good at that versus, oh my God, you have to talk to Larry. Absolutely Larry, yeah. because he's top of mind. I know him and we have a relationship and that, there's a big difference there between, okay, well, maybe I'll get in touch with him. Or no, no, you don't understand, Brian. If you don't call him today, I'm telling you, I know he's really busy. You got to call him today. Right, right, right. Well, and I want to get uh, back to something you said is, is um, it, 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 not everyone on this is a salesperson, but you know, it, it, to, to me, we're all salespeople. And what, what I mean is if you're working in a department, I don't care if you're, if you're in the engineering department, product development, you're always selling, right? Everyone, you have to be a great communicator. So let's remove the word selling and let's just say, you know, influencer. And, and so you have to, there's a, there's really good salespeople internally and there's really bad ones, right? It's why, there's training programs on conflict management, which is comical to me that if you're, you know, if, if your department is full of conflict, to me, it's, it's a real simple formula. It's, it's not enough people are asking questions. And if you look at the ineffective influencer or communicator where they really blow it is they have their idea. 
and they have to, let's say, Joe, you're, you're someone who I have to sell internally. You're not even an outside prospect. And I've got this idea, and I know you're a key decision maker in this thing, whether it's going to go, maybe you're one of several, but I got to start with Joe. Well, I can come into you, Joe, and I could say, Joe, I've got an idea, and I can make a bunch of statements. Joe, we need to do this. It's got to be done this way. The reason why the way we're doing it now isn't working. And so what I'm doing is communicating in the form of statements. Now, I want to take you back to high school class where you learn that for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So we're all contrarians. And so the more I tell you, Joe, why we're doing something wrong and we need to do it better, the first thing you're doing in your brain is developing the equal and opposite response. It's an automatic thing that happens. I tell you one thing, I make a statement. It might be something as simple as this, Joe. I might say, hey, Joe, the weather out here in Kansas City, it's, it's going to be... 95 degrees this weekend. Oh, I'm not looking forward to it. And in your brain, you know what you just said? Oh, I, I'm dying for the heat. I, it rained all summer. So we've all had those conversations where people seem to disagree with everything we say, and it's just a natural response. And so what's the opposite of this? The opposite is, is try to lead people to your conclusion, give them a shot at it. And so rather than me come and saying, Joe, we need to do this. I would say, Joe, I need your advice. You know, I saw this happening and, you know, I have some thoughts. How do you think it should be handled? And, you know, a lot of times you're going to come up with the exact same conclusion that I had, but because it came out of your brain and your mouth, you own it. Mm -hmm. And now we can expand on it. Now the walls are down. Now I can give my opinion and lead you here. And by the way, this is the great tool of, of great leaders, right? It's because it's, leadership is selling. I've got to get somebody to come to my way of thinking, but I can either tell them to do it mm -hmm. or I can help lead them to it. And, and it, it seems so simple, um, but it is, it is the formula of amazing communicators. And, and when I watch, whether it's a sales presentation or maybe an internal meeting where someone's trying to sell it to their team, and I sit there and say, stop talking so much, stop making so many st statements, because not only are you not bringing them closer to you, they're, they're crafting the rebuttal to you right now. And you don't even know it because you're so into yourself and you're so into your damn message, you're blowing it. And, 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 and I think that's a simple thing. Hey, just ask more questions and really listen to what they're saying. I know we've all heard that a thousand times before, but it's easy. We know it, but it's such a hard thing to do. And it took me years to try to get good at it. You, you never really arrive there. You, there's just an awareness that, holy crap, I may be talking, talking too much, or the way I'm selling this might be a little bit too much of this. Mm -hmm. Which think of our political environment right now. The reason why we all hate each other is because of the way we're communicating to each other. I'm telling you, this is how you have to think. And I'm saying, no, I don't. You're telling me this is how I have to think. I say, no, I don't. Rather than saying, let's, let's try to understand the way of thinking. You know, let's respect each other and, and learn. Just learn, right? Instead of teach all the time. And, mm -hmm. and that, so you don't have to be a salesperson to do that. That's, that's all of us. James just wrote guilty. That's a common. <laughs> uh, yeah. No, I, I have a, a parenting moment to share. I just shut the door because it's about a child that might hear me. Um, Beth told me um, about something that one of my boys is going through and um, she's the easier parent. This should surprise no one. Um, so he kind of confided in her and she kind of told me. And uh, I said to her, you know, when it's appropriate, tell him that he would be proud of the way dad responded. And I made a point of this. I said, don't, don't say dad um, supports you or, you know, dad's behind you or, you know, but instead encourage him to own how he would feel about me feeling about him. And how'd it, you do it? I don't understand. What do you mean? How did I do it? So, you, so you had to have that conversation with him to try to. Oh, no, no, no. I, I haven't. I haven't talked to him yet about it. Oh, okay. But I said when she tells him, you know, it comes up. You know, I was talking to dad, and you'd be really proud of the way he responded, as opposed to, and he was completely insupportable. That was like on him, like me on him. I want you to know that. And it goes to your point about making that person take ownership of how they feel about a situation. Yeah, yeah. You know, funny you bring that up. So my son just graduated from Arizona State University a few months back. And he was in this honors program, which you know, I was really proud of him. He had great grades and it was his junior year and it was summer. I remember we were driving a car somewhere 
And he said, you know, dad, I don't think I want to be in the honors program my senior year. And, and of course the father in you, you know, wants to say the hell you're, you're not leaving that thing. I put cash into this thing for three years. Buck up, buddy. You got one more year. Now that's what every bone in my body wanted to say to the kid. Now there's, there's a little technique um, that I teach in my negotiation skills class and it's called mirroring, right? And so um, it, it's, it's a, it, let me tell you how I handled this. So rather than fire on him by making statements that would have put his walls up, turned him into a contrarian, made him think I have to get out of this, it's my own decision. All I did was say this back to him. I repeated the last few words that he said Mm -hmm. and it forced him to talk. So he said, yeah, dad, I don't want to really do this. So I said, and you, you, you could do this by saying, it seems like, it looks like, it, I'm, I'm, I'm hearing this. I said, no, Jake, so it seems like you've given up on your dream to someday own your own company. And I just shut up. Oh, no, no, dad, I absolutely, you know, I mean, you know, I'm going to get go out in the real world and get you know, some experience out there. But yes, that really would be my dream. And I, and I, I didn't add in any color. Now, and then he kept talking and then he kept talking before you knew it. I didn't have to say much of anything. And he said, I know it's, you know, I probably stupid for me to do. And I just, in the old days, I would have been dad moment. I better perk up. I better, you know, no, be a thought authoritarian, authoritarian. And it really, it really worked. And that was one example. And I, I, you know, you talk about kids, we learn so much in our interactions with kids. And, and, you know, even in one of the stories I tell in, in, in many of my seminars now, is when I'm writing my first book, I was writing the listening skills chapter of this book. And this is comical because it's four in the afternoon on Friday. My job was to write one chapter a week for 20 weeks, finish this book in 20 weeks. I couldn't start my weekend until I typed the last word of that chapter. And I'm two pages into this listening skills chapter and he busts through the door and he's four years old. And he says, daddy, daddy, look at this. I made this construction paper apple tree. Look at it. And he's showing it to me and I'm typing and I'm fake listening to him. I'm like, oh, really? Oh, Elmer's glue. But I'm not really listening to him. I'm blowing him off. Irony is I'm writing a listening skills chapter. He knows I'm blowing him off. He takes off. I type the last word about three hours later and I read what I wrote and it said, don't ever fake listen with your most important customers. They'll know faking and they won't forget it. And I went, oh, oh. and I ran out to that kitchen and I said, Jake, Jake, how are you? But it was funny. It hit me. I said, how often do I do this? Where I don't, you know, I'm not really listening. I'm faking it. And I said, if I'm faking with my number one customers, how am I doing with the paying customers? I bet I'm faking a lot with them too. And so I love those lessons that we get. We get better if in those interactions, if we if we look for for it, right? But again, it takes humility to say, uh, you know, I, I don't know everything as a dad, and I, I think that's important. You know, I'm. This is just. I'm wondering. I'm asking our viewers to just kind of think when you when you showed up today, if you had any expectation at all, and if so, what you thought somebody that I promote as an amazing salesperson, what did you expect? And I. I suspect that people who didn't know you before would have expected something a bit more and you gotta and aggressive and go and and I think the thing that I'm feeling with you is as I often do which is why I enjoy you so much is you're just so human we're just talking and I think you know that kind of humility and I, I think confidence is a very important thing too now you know as someone who's um, um, had my own issues with confidence, which may surprise some folks, but we don't need to go into uh, family histories of mental illness and swings and such. But I will say that, you know, one of the issues that comes up with uh, clients often is I believe the only kind of marketing left is educating people and giving and responding and just being human. I think that's it. I mean, but what about the web and what about the email? Still, it comes down to, I know who you are and I care. That's it. That's it. And it's how scalable is that? They say it's as scalable as, as it can be. And you need it to be because in my business, I just need one or two clients and I'm good for the year. Um, well, what if I have to sell a million widgets? You know, it was Gunter's uh, partner at the time, uh, Sam, when I was working with them and I went down to Florida a few times and got to know them. Um, Sam told me something that I never forgot. And he said, if you're selling, you know, a GE, um, you know, device and there are a half dozen competitors and um, somebody's talking with you 
and you want to make a sale and they say something that you know that you know for that you might want to go to my competitor say it because then you know more than anything you're you're um you're trustworthy you're credible it's like look i don't want you to think of me as the ge guy i want you to think of me as the most knowledgeable person in this category so you can say hey sam i have a category question oh and you know what for this you know you can say at the end you know there's a reason i sell ge i could be at any of these companies i chose ge because i know relative to these other things in balance mine's the best product but for that thing yeah that's not us you might want to talk to them well it's like Thank you, Sam. You get a raving fan out of that versus every time I, it's like, yeah. my God, my G is great. I'll get back to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so the attitude you're talking about is called slight indifference. Oh, it's I like this. There's a real thing to it. Give us a lesson, doctor. It's, a, it's the most powerful posture in negotiation. It's, it's, um, it's conveying that you're committed to helping someone, but you're not attached to it. And that's what you're describing, right? And, and so, um, in fact, we teach, let's say even the young salespeople. So I teach a lot of young salespeople who do have to bang the phones and make those 50 calls a day. And they, you know, they don't have the stature. At our age, we can feel like we can be the wise men and be that. But, you know, the 22-year-old kid can't do that, right? right. He's got to bang or she's got to bang the phones. Right. And so even part of um, the the script and we do give them a script but it's not robotic but it's mm -hmm. you know here's how you get past the gatekeeper which by the way is by being really nice and asking for help you see mm -hmm. so it still ties that's one of my favorite videos of yours by the way <laughs> right right and so after we and then we, we talk about these hooks okay so you need something to say it's going to create curiosity so at least they don't hang up on you you might have to do it six times with the same client right but after you hook, right? So if I said, hey, Joe, listen, I reached out. I saw you on LinkedIn. Great article. Love what you're doing here. The reason I wanted to reach out was we were working with a similar company last year. And we put it in a process that helped them do blank, blank, and blank. Now, it's something we call a takeaway. The takeaway is, now, I don't know if you guys are even having those issues or, or if you'd even have an interest in something like this. But that's why I'm reaching out. See, so that's a takeaway. And so it's so important because what it's saying is, Joe, I'm throwing it out there. But I'm not, you know, I'm committed to helping you, but I'm not really attached to it. And that's what that little takeaway does. So it's a really good for anyone who's selling anything. Again, it could be internally to someone. Hey, CEO, I've got this idea. We're working here. I don't know if you find value in this. What's your take on it? Right. And, and so it's still a humble attitude, but it's very purposeful. Right? And it's very repeatable, which is very different than the untrained salesperson who was told 22 year old, here's the product, go pick up the phone, make a lot of phone calls, but they never teach them what the heck to do or say, mm -hmm. and they have to figure it out on their own. The only reason I exist is to try to add a little comfort to these people who don't know what's gonna come out of their mouth, mm -hmm. right? And that's when you feel pressure is when you don't know what's coming out of your mouth. And, and um, you know, and that's where I help to heal people. Uh, and it takes time to, 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 to you know, build a cadence, but when built with authenticity, you become repeatedly better than most who are selfish and untrained in what to say. You know, when I um, when I need to write uh, a message that is, you know, oftentimes uh, clients, um, their best prospects are on LinkedIn and they want to start a conversation with them, but they don't really know them. And what I try to do is I find a name in their list and I try to write them that one person a message as humanly and as like conversationally as I can. Um, and if it feels right, I think there's no reason I couldn't say that to all of these people as a starting point. So one of the most, Jorg's on the, on the line and we've um, done this campaign for him. In fact, I've done it for a half dozen clients. They want to start a conversation. And I say, the first thing let's do is let's download your first connections. Let's sort them into three groups. Green is these are pro potential customers. Yellow, these are potential influencers. And red is that's my sister. She has nothing to do with this. I'm just going to leave them out. And for the greens and the yellows, I often start the conversation with, uh, I've been really bad and out of touch. How have you been? Or something like that. How's business? And the response rate is, you know, maybe as much as a third. It might just be, we're good, York, thanks. It might be, 
yeah, it's been really busy over here. What have you been up to? Which gives you the license to say, well, you know, I'm still with Omnica and we've been blah, 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 blah. Do you do anything like that? I don't, I lost track. Do you do that? Well, actually, you know, and then you can start that way. Just very conversational. Um, do you know Jason Banks? It's a new name. Yes, for me. Jason Banks. Absolutely. So, so he's, he's, he just, he's on the call and he left this comment. He's with me. Yeah. In that fact, was one of your Jason, buddies? He, he, he works on your team? Uh, he, for one of my clients. Okay. Yeah. One of my, one of my best clients, he, Jason is one of the best leaders uh, and, and not just brown nosing here. He, everything that you and I love for kind of building relationships on LinkedIn. Um, Jason's one of those guys who finds really good content and posts it and it turns into great conversations. I mean, and, and he, he just commented in the Q and a section. He said, no, I know. I, in fact, I'm making an exception. I don't typically bring folks who aren't premium members on camera, but I invited him to become a panelist if he wants to yeah. come on and say hi one of the smartest guys, uh, guys I know, but um, yeah, I'm with you, Joe. I love what I love about what you said here is with LinkedIn is actually being purposeful in, in, in targeting. And I, I don't love the word targeting, but deciding who you're going to reach out to and mm -hmm. making it slightly indifferent and casual. Mm -hmm. I, I think really good. And, and that's, I mean, you've, you've been doing it forever and it just, you built friendships and, mm -hmm. and um, I, I, I just, it, it, it comes easy for you because I know you've never been a fan of sort of the pushy, right? And that's, that scares people. I mean, sales training, even that you know, scares you know, people like, oh my. It's true. Well, I mean, for, I think I have a, 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 the luxury of not having a boss. I mean, Beth, technically, but um, not having a boss and not having to fill in any Salesforce pipeline percent likelihood of closing and where are we and I need an update every week. Um, I can just throw something out there and be like, if it's right, it's right. Um, if it makes sense, it makes sense. And, you know, I've had folks uh, from my conference attempt to, um, they, they said they want to, they want to sponsor or they, they, you know, do I have a booth and can they, you know, promote their stuff? And I say, look, my conference is different. Mine is like, um, an annual reunion of my friends. Please don't come to my event and try to sell my friends some shit. If you want to come and get to know us, commune here, have a real conversation and should something naturally come up, you say, you know, I know someone who, like, oh, really? All day long, please come. And by the way, you don't need to pay a sponsorship fee for that. Buy a regular ticket like everybody else and just be a person contribute where it makes sense to contribute and that's more effective than i'm standing behind the booth and hey you know um before we get to our next speaker uh, bill why don't you come up here and and you know he's one of our sponsors he's trying to tell you a little bit about his stuff and i'm like oh okay so five minutes to check email i, I don't I, I already paid for a ticket i don't need to you know that guy paid more than i paid so he's entitled to sell me shit that's not why i'm here i I want to learn something and, and he's a good guy and I want to, you know. Right, right, yeah. It costs yeah. me money because I could get, you know, multiple times the ticket sale, but I don't ever want to be in a position where someone is like, I can't believe I paid Joe Hage that much money. I want them to be like, I can't believe that I paid Joe Hage that little. Like I got so much value out of it. And, uh, you know, that's, I can live with myself. Yeah, well, and you, you have to, um be eager to meet a lot of people. You and I have been to a lot of these conventions and you'll see the same five guys hanging out with each other. And you talked about those standing behind a booth who look like they're miserable doing it. And mm -hmm. I say, why aren't you in purchasing instead of sales? Nothing nice. Like buyers, right? and, and because I know you, that's like the biggest insult you could give. You basically said, you know what? Sales guy. You suck. <laughs> <laughs> wow, what a loser uh, you are. You losers, you know, only salespeople. You don't know anything about selling. What are you doing here? <laughs> uh, I have an well, administrative you know, job for you that you don't have to interact with humans. You'll be great at it. <laughs> Put yourself in materials <laughs> management. Just bury yourself in the basement, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, it's, it's, um, it, it, but it, it is that attitude of you don't know who, you don't know what will come from the new friend that you have, right? And, and, you know, and I know we've, we've repeated this over and over, but it is wild how much great stuff comes from folks who you just, you just met. And, and 
it's I, I, to me, it's, it's so much fun about going to those events. This is why I've been longing for the world to open up again, mm -hmm. right? You think about what I did for a living was being on a plane every week, going to these meetings and doing the keynote and meeting people and feeling like a rock star on stage, Joe, right? But the most of the fun would come from hanging out and having a cocktail with the, with the crew after. I'm going to ask you a personal life. question you can choose to answer or not. Yeah. What did COVID do to the Sullivan Empire in terms so, of earnings? Yeah. Because so, I imagine you can charge a lot more when you get on the plane versus, you know, I'll zoom in for an hour. Yeah, um, not much less, actually. And if you think that the, the people would do their meetings virtually, think of the money they were saving on travel costs and all of these other things. Mm -hmm. and, and so... Um, like everyone else I had to be really good at doing what I do virtually. And my whole goal was to try to make it feel as much like a live session as possible. I would do Joe a day and a half, day and a half zoom presentations. And at first I'm like, people are going to be falling asleep or checking Facebook. Mm -hmm. So in all my presentations, uh, what I would do is I would set up the camera and I would stand. First of all, standing when you are doing a formal presentation does something to your body. And that makes you a better presenter. So I would stand and I would walk around and I would you still use props. And I, if I would tell a story, you know, I'd still turn my head this way. There's times to look in the camera. And so, you know, we really focused on how can we become great virtual presenters? And then you'd be amazed at how much we taught others how to become great virtual presenters. So I had to really morph my business into the process doesn't change. Um, just the vehicle that we're using, which in this case would be Zoom or Teams, um, is a little bit different. Mm -hmm. But it, you have to, it's still game day, right? And whether you're in a boardroom uh, or on stage or whatever, you got to treat that Zoom presentation like it's showtime, which means you better be just as prepared. You better know what your opening is going to be. You're going to know when to add stories to your presentation, right? You're, so, so, so you try to make it as, as close as possible. And so, um, yeah, I had a really good year last year. Um, and, and I didn't have to travel much. And so it wasn't bad, but I'm, I'm, I'm excited to fall is packed. I'm, I'm going to be back on the road of boatload and, um, we'll see if, we'll see if I still have it, Joe. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you do. And I'm sure Mrs. Sullivan will be glad to get you out of that house a little bit. Oh my gosh. You know, I, I, you can only watch so much vampire diaries and bachelorette, Joe. I'm, I've had enough. Yeah. I <laughs> um, I want to, um, the two things, one, uh, just a quick anecdote, um, for websites, of course, you need content, you need to write stuff. And for educating, you need to say stuff. And when I have a client who's really an engineer at heart, or just an engineer, and they're like, look, I don't, my advice to them is record yourself all the time. Because the content that you're developing just by answering the questions when you're in your own element, that is what people want you for in the first place. So don't be like, I don't know how to write or I hate writing or when I get around to it, I'll write a blog post. No, just answer questions that you answer in your job and people will be like, wow, this guy or gal really knows what they're talking about. Um, so I wanted to make that point I, and I knew that I would get some quick nods from you on that. So it was really just about validating me as a person. The second thing is uh, there are some folks on the call, I'm sure, who are like, I get it. These people are just saying, be human, be open, be honest, be truthful all these kind of like human things, but maybe that's a luxury that comes with people who have the confidence of a Joe or a Brian to, I have no script here. I had nothing prepared. We're 45 minutes in. I haven't ruined this too badly. I'm not that comfortable. I need a little bit of, can you give us, here comes the teaching part where people get out their pens and papers if they still exist. Can you give us a Top five, Brian. Now, I know you have an acronym. Maybe you'll take us through what each of those letters stand for. Sure. Yeah. So um, I want to get back to your, your point of, you know, confidence is very important. But I, what I find is often my best students, who are often the best salespeople, aren't the extroverts, right? The, it, often it's harder for me to coach an extrovert into becoming a great salesperson because they are often so focused on themselves and their message that I have to sort of break them down and teach them to be humble and learners, right? It's often that person in my class or in my, you know, the session I do, who's really quiet, who's just sitting, taking notes, doesn't say a word, never raises their hand. And um, the reason why those folks are so good is they know that they need a process, they're not confident enough in their ability to, to, to fly by the seat of their pants and just freestyle it, right? 
And so this process, you know, without you know giving you a, a, a seminar here, it's precise, which is the name of my company. It's just think of your preparation. What's your objective? So if I call Joe, what Write do I want? Write stuff down, folks. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, and, and I can send you stuff on it as well too. But be prepared. And what is what is your objective? Now, see, so Joe, you know, it, well, this is casual. We're having this conversation. If I had to make a call on you and I was really trying to sell you something because I believe it would help you, right? I'm really, if you're, you gotta believe in what the hell you're selling. Um, I would think, what do I want Joe to commit to as a result of our conversation today? And that commitment might just be a next phone call, right? But we're not just gonna see where it goes. It's gonna feel that way to Joe, but there's purpose in why we are doing this. It doesn't make you a bad person to have purpose. And that purpose is we're either going to move to the next step or we're not. Either way, I'm slightly indifferent. Mm -hmm. I'm committed to helping Joe, but I'm not attached to it, right? Mm -hmm. And the first, the next thing is this R is respect and trust. I'm not going to start pushing stuff on Joe. I have to bring the walls down. And these are the things you're really good at. What's going to come out of my mouth that's going to make Joe say, this feels like a nice conversation. But that too is purposeful and it's okay, right? Uh, then I will engage you with questions. There's the E of precise. Now, I'm not just going to hope a great question comes out of my mouth. I should have already written down and know based on the homework I've done, what questions will get Joe to really open up. And you're going to give me some nuggets and I'm going to find some pains. I'm going to find some things that work, but we're developing what our conversation will be, which then becomes C, which now convey my solution. But that still becomes interactive. I might say, Joe, based on what you told me, I think I might have something that will work for you. It worked for some other folks. I don't work for you. And now I will present. And then I'll say, Joe, based on this, I mean, would this help you? Like, when would you use this? Would you even use it? Joe's going to sell himself. And I'm going to say, hmm, good point. Then we'll move on to the next topic. We're going to chat it out, right? Joe, you may eventually get and say, ah, Sally, I, I got a problem with this, though. That's indecision. There's your eye of precise. I've already heard that objection 18 times. I know what's going to come out of my mouth. But I'm going to say, Joe, tell me a little bit more about this. You're going to talk. We're going to converse. Then I'm going to find the real problem. And a lot of times, bad salespeople, they hear an objection. They think that's the problem. That's not the problem. If, that, if the client knew their problem, they would have solved it a long time ago. So your job is to get to the real root of the problem. And that means you've got to be really good at, at, at asking the questions that get them to open up and find this issue that they didn't even know existed. The S of precise is I, secure I, agreement. Hold on with the S because I'm really intrigued yeah. by that. If the client yeah. knew the problem, they would have solved it already. That yeah. doesn't seem intuitive to me. Look, I know that my you know, computer speed is too slow. I know that's the problem. There's nothing deeper. I'm just really frustrated by it, but I can't find a way where I live to get better internet service. Sure. All right. So something on it is a very, you know, that's a, a very simple. So at a higher well, level, so, yeah. so, so well, I'll give you an example, right? So I, I be, um, became friends with a guy named Dan Burris. Dan Burris spends a lot of time in this He's a big time consultant in healthcare. And he tells a great story. He said he was working with Eli Lilly. And Eli Lilly came to him and said, you know, we've got a problem. The only time we make money is when we have drugs in the pipeline. But the problem is for us to get drugs in the pipeline, we need to hire molecular engineers, a ton of molecular engineers. That costs a lot of money. So we don't want to invest all this money in molecular engineers, but that's the only way we get products in the pipeline. And Dan says, well, your problem's not your problem. It's another problem. So the problem wasn't that you have to, the problem is, is I don't want to spend money on all these molecular engineers. The problem is you need more drugs in the pipeline. So they're trying to solve the problem by hiring more molecular engineers instead of finding the real solution, which is, and what they ended up doing was posting the, the molecular issues on the internet and people would give their solutions and Eli Lilly only had to pay for the solutions they wanted to buy. So, so had Joe spent his time on what they thought was the problem, investing in molecular engineers, how can we afford more of them? They were solving the wrong problem. The problem could be solved in a different way, right? And so, so, so what, what does it mean to us? It's, it's don't assume what is coming out of their mouth is the real issue. You have to keep asking questions and together you may realize, hmm, we're solving the wrong issue. Let's find the, you know, the solution in some other way. So it's just, it's, it comes from asking third, fourth, and fifth level questions. Right? Okay. Just to let everyone see that I have been paying attention. P is prepare. <laughs> R is respect. E is engage. Yeah. C is convey. Yeah. I is indecision. 
S. S is secure agreement. So if, if I've got you nodding your head and you're like, yeah, this, yeah, this yeah, might make sense. Hmm, okay, if I get a few of those yeses, and maybe my objective is just get to the Zoom presentation, the more detailed presentation where I'm bringing in teammates, I'll say, Joe, based on what we, we talked about, what do you think? I mean, do you think it's worth more research? Oh, I really do, Brian. So I have to get you to say something like that. And I'd say, Joe, with your permission, keywords, with your permission, Joe, I'd really love to set up a time where I can get with our, our engineer and get on a Zoom meeting for, for 30 minutes. Well, why don't we walk through some of the screenshots and see if there's a use case where it, it might work for you. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. Um, I've, I can make myself available anytime early next week. I mean, what makes sense for you? Early in the week, middle of the week? Ah, probably early in the week, great. And let's get our calendars out, which is also very important. Try to schedule the meeting right now. Don't say, hey, let's get together later. I'll hit you up. Mm -hmm. All right, Joe, I'd be doing this. I'd say, Joe, I'm looking here. I, I've got Monday afternoon. You want to do three o'clock? Mm -hmm. Do it now because you want to go back to your life. You've got that kid. You've got, the, and if, if, I don't want to start dating you over the next two weeks trying to get you to commit to a meeting. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. secure an agreement. And that agreement, by the way, I'd be no Sully. I have no damn interest in you. Thanks, Joe. We won't date each other. We won't. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Right? And then the E is explore. So, before I hang up, I, I might say, hey, Joe, you know, in a, it, it, some of the things you were telling me, you mentioned this. I also picked up on this and this. When we do that meeting next week, would it make sense for me to also introduce another process that we put in place? We helped a similar client. You, you think there might be interest in that? So I might explore for another add-on uh -huh. conversation, or I might say this, let's say I just closed you up for the big deal, Joe. I might say, Joe, would you do me a favor? If after six months, our solution does everything that you thought it would, would you be willing to write me a testimonial and help me grow my business. Mm -hmm. and, and so I'm exploring for referrals. I don't think in healthcare, we do a great job of asking for referrals. If we acted more like the financial planning industry, <laughs> we'd probably do better, but, but gosh, too often it's okay. If you do good for people, it's okay to go back and ask for help. So that there's your process, right? There's your, there's your two day seminar in, in six minutes. I appreciate that. Maya, I saw you. Oh, I see. I, okay. Um, I saw you come on for a second there. I, I wanted to ask you to uh, share your uh, issue uh, with with sales, what your problem is, and, and the, because I I know what it is, and I think Sully could help. But um, if there's anyone else in the meanwhile who has uh, a I running into this problem, what would you do in this situation, Sully? This will we'll do one or two of these. Uh, so what my problem is with selling. No, um, I mean, just, I, I happen to know the situation of where your company was founded, where they are, do their most business, what you're trying to do, what frustrations you've had. Would you tell Sully in a nutshell what you do and what you're encountering? Sure. Well, uh, let's see here in a nutshell. Uh, so our company is headquartered in Denmark. That's where I'm from as well. Uh, it was founded over there in 1982 by my dad. And we sell uh, laser therapy equipment that, uh, in very short, accelerates the natural healing. Works really well for a number of different issues like sports injuries, carpal tunnel syndrome, tennis elbow, back pain, arthritis pain, lots of different issues. Um, so Essentially, we sell to uh, chiropractors, physical therapists, massage therapists, um, some MDs, um, vets, horse practitioners. Um, it can be used both for humans and, and animals. Um, so we've, you know, done really well, uh, you know, throughout these many years, uh, especially in Europe. And then about seven years ago, I got involved. I, I was already living here in the U.S. And so I got involved and to try to sort of help expand uh the company here in, in the us so that's sort of my yeah yeah my my job marketing and selling and you know and all the other stuff that kind of comes along with running an office um so uh and selling, i think selling in america challenging what why have you what do you believe is the reason you made relatively little traction in america um well, first of all, it's a huge country <laughs> um, compared to compared to, you know, like Denmark, for instance. Um, and there are a lot of other laser companies out there that are more well known than we are uh, in the US, at least, you know, so far. Um, so I think it's just, yeah, brand awareness and um, and also, just, I mean, there's like huge potential. There's so many different, you know, so many different market or target groups too, like chiropractors, physical therapists, vets, horse people. I mean, there's, it's, there's a lot of potential and it's, um, 
and yeah, also a lot of yeah, a lot of competition, I guess. Well, let's talk most... about one in particular. You one of the markets you target is chiropractors, am I right? Yes. Yep. What is so your challenge in one. penetrating that market? Um, I think it well, I think first of all, it's that it, it is a really big country. And so like at first we tried to do, you know, a little bit of like national advertising and we sort of realized, okay, that's a lot of money for trying to reach all of the United States. Um, so then we started focusing a little bit more just here in the Midwest because well, that's where I <laughs> where I live. Um, so I, I think we've done okay here in the Midwest, but it's just like, there's still a lot of, a lot of potential, I think. Um, and so it's just kind of, yeah, I think it's brand awareness is probably sort of, you know, one of the, I guess. What, one what's of the your options. sales channel? Do you use manufacturer reps? Do you have your own salespeople? How do you get, how do you uh, spread the message to these individual offices? Right. I mean, we have a few distributors around the U.S. And then other than that, I'm it in the U.S. <laughs> so um, I'll go to like trade shows and, you know, like chiropractic association conferences. And uh, we do a little bit of advertising uh, in like, you know, membership magazines. Um, we do email newsletters, social media. But I know there's a lot more we could do with social media and newsletters. Like I know that we just need to like prioritize more time there. Um, yeah. So See, to me, that's yeah. all about convey, which is halfway through the precise model. We haven't had a chance to be, I think there's a lot of one-to-one -one work that you can do. And you might say, yeah, I'd love to do that, but that's not scalable. How do I? So mm -hmm. Sully, how, you know, here's yeah. one gal sure. trying to do everything, sure. um, but she has a compelling product for an audience that would benefit using it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, um, for, so how do I pronounce your name? Maya. Okay. So, so Maya, have you had, all right. So to me, it, because it's a piece of equipment, there needs to be a lot of conversations in office about this product. So if, if I were to help you, what I would say is who are potential manufacturer and rep partners who are already walking into these facilities each day. And I have two very good friend companies who good technologies like you go to these folks because they're already on the street doing this. To me, what you need is either people banging the phones or showing up and saying, so let's say it's Dr. Hey, I, hey, I'm in here and I'm selling you uh, maybe a, 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 an ultrasound in your, your office, okay? We already have, I've already sold you the ultrasound. I want that guy or gal to be able to say, hey, doctor, by the way, we just partnered with a company based out of Denmark and they've got a device that will do blank, blank, blank. Would there be any interest in seeing a demo on this? So you need a lot more of those conversations being had. Now in your role, you have to say, okay, now you have to give up margin. Is the margin worth, right? Or is it the money I'm spending on social media for these advertising, is it offset by these conversations? I always say 100% yes. If you have 50 people on the street today while you and I are talking, and we know that there's 10 conversations being had one-on-one, -on -one, looking someone in the eye, or if it's an inside sales team, they're talking about your product. You need that more to me than someone looking at a, you know, a, a, a fancy slick on your technology. The other reason why this is important is because you don't have the brand awareness. That will be offset by the relationship that that sales rep already has with the physician. If you do a great job of selling these reps on your credibility and your quality, and you're going to support the heck out of them, when he says, hey, Dr. Hey, trust me, this is a really good technology. That's good enough. I didn't know, I didn't need to see the fancy brand. Even if it doesn't say mm -hmm. GE, I trust that person. It goes back to mm -hmm. being Joe. Joe said, hey, that, that, that rep's got the respect and trust already that, and they're carrying you in and, and they're, they're, you know, they're attaching you to them. And that's, that credibility is worth way more than the other. So if you're ever interested just in having a conversation with a couple of uh, uh, partner groups of mine, you know, they've got 50, one rep, the group has 50 reps, another one has 75 reps, and they exist solely for folks like you who have really good technology, but they have no idea where to go with it. The other reason I like this model, it's, 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 uh, it's a commission-based thing. So you can, if, and they're not easy to get in, you've got to present your, your case really good to these folks. You may end up giving anywhere between eight and 12%, but you're only paying if they're 1099, you're only paying if they, if they sell the product, that's the dream setup for you. Right. right. So, so if, if you ever want an intro to some of these, I, I can, I can certainly help you. And the other good news is, you know, these two companies I'm talking about, 
selfishly, they use precise selling as their model. So I'll, I'll make sure that when they go in, they're representing you well. Right. <laughs> uh, that sounds, that sounds awesome. I yeah, think we I, can I, tell I would, this to your dad. Yeah, I would definitely be interested. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Maya. And thank you, thank Brian. You. That was great. Um, I don't know what else to say. I mean, you, you, I, I, I will say I, I got exactly what I hoped we would accomplish today, which is teaching folks about Precise. Um, your site, I think, is PreciseSelling.com. Am I right? Yeah, PreciseSelling.com. Um, yeah. And uh, you put out typically a weekly video, three minutes yeah. long, easy to watch, good reminders, a lot of common sense, but often common sense uh, eludes us when we're so focused on something that you might forget something as simple as just saying hi and things like that. So yeah. Yeah. 10 years, that's a lot of Sully, but it's been a good 10 years for me. Well, same here, Joe. I hope we've got 20 more. I don't want to be doing this in 25 years, Joe. I want to be sitting on a beach chair um, with a corona in my hand and just be an old wise man. Maybe I'll have a nice show like this on Fridays and get my friends together. There you go. <laughs> I love it. It's the highlight of my week. So thank you everyone for watching. Uh, next week, a very different topic. We're going to be talking with Leo Eisner. And he is uh, the 60601 guy. He knows a lot about regulations and you'll want to uh, tune in, if not for yourself, but for someone who says, do you know someone who? So uh, for Joe Hage and Joe Hage Enterprises, this has been Brian Sullivan, the precise selling.com man and my friend. Thanks, Sully. Amen. Thanks, Joe. Have a great weekend, everyone. Bye.